Hey everyone, it's Dr. Mark Hahn, and this is chapter 9 on joints. This is a relatively long chapter, so I'm probably going to divide this up into different parts. So this is part 1 for chapter 9. So what are joints? We know that the rigid elements of the skeleton will meet at joints or articulations. We use the Greek word arthro uh, when referring to joints, so arthro means joint. So the structure of joints enables resistance to crushing, tearing, and other forces. Now joints can be classified by either function or structure. So first we're going to talk about the functional classification of joints. Uh, functional classification is based on the amount of movement. So we have synarthroses. Synarthroses are immovable joints, and these types of joints are common in the axial skeleton. Amphiarthroses, these are slightly movable joints and are also common in the axial skeleton. And then we have diarthroses. Diarthroses are freely movable and are common in the appendicular skeleton or the uh, skeleton of the upper and lower limbs. So all synovial joints are diarthroses uh, type of joints. We also have the structural classification of joints. Structural classification is based on the material that binds the bones together, the presence or absence of a joint cavity, and then structural classifications will include fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. So chapter 9.1 actually does a really good job of summarizing the different joint classes. So we have um, classification based on structure. We have uh, fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. And then we have uh, joint classification based on function or mobility. So we have our synarthroses, amphiarthroses, and diarthroses. So the first joint that we're going to talk about are fibrous joints. These are adjoin adjoining bones that are united by colli um, collagenic fibers. And we have different types of fibrous joints. We have sutures, syndesmoses, and gumphoses. Uh, sutures have short fibers. They are immobile. I'm sorry, immobile, meaning they don't move. And these are classified as a synarthrosis. So sutures, especially within the skull, are immobile. Syndesmoses have longer fibers. These are slightly movable joints, so slightly mobile, also known as amphiarthroses. And they're also immobile as well. So uh, there are synarthroses types of syndesmoses. Gumphoses, um, these are found in the periodontal ligaments of the teeth. So basically, these are the ligaments that are holding your teeth down into their sockets. And these are immobile or synarthroses type joints based on uh, function. We then have cartilaginous joints. Uh, the adjoining bones are united by cartilage. And we have two types. We have a syn synchondroses and a symphysis. A synchondroses, um, these types of cartilaginous joints uh, include, are made up of hyaline cartilage and are immobile. So functionally, they are synarthroses. And then we have symphysis, like the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis we know is um, made up of fibrocartilage. And uh, functionally, they are slightly movable, so they can be classified functionally as amphiarthroses. The next type of structural class of joints is syn are synovial joints. This is when an adjoining bone or adjoining bones are separated by a joint cavity. They're covered with an articular cartilage and enclosed within an articular capsule lined with a synovial membrane. So synovial joints are the only uh, type of joints that have a joint cavity. And we have different types of synovial joints. We have plane, hinge, pivot, condylar, saddle, and ball and sockets. And then functionally speaking, um, all synovial joints are free me freely movable. So they are uh, considered diarthroses functionally. Um, and the movement will depend upon the design of the joint. So first we're going to talk about fibrous joints. These are bones that are connected by fibrous connective tissue do not have a joint cavity, and most are immovable or slightly movable. Uh, there are three types of fibrous joints. We have sutures, syndesmoses, and gumphoses. Sutures, um, this is when bones are tightly bound by a minimal, minimal amount of fibrous tissue 
occur only between the bones of the skull. Sutures allow bone growth so the skull can expand with the brain during childhood, um, and we know this fibrous tissue will ossify in middle age. Uh, the closure of sutures is called synostosis. Syndesmoses, these are when bones are connected exclusively by ligaments. Uh, the amount of movement depends on the length of the uh, fibers. Um, so we have the tibiofibular joints. Uh, this is the joint between the tibia and the fibula in the leg. Uh, these are an immovable type of synarthroses. We then have the interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna. Uh, these are freely movable, so functionally they are classified as diarthroses. So while all synarthroses type uh, joints are um, classified as diarthroses, functionally not all diarthroses are synovial joints. So we can see that uh, the interosseous membrane is not a synovial joint, but it is freely movable, so it can be functionally classified as diarthroses. Gumphoses, um, basically it's a tooth in a socket. There is a connecting ligament called the periodontal ligament that basically um, anchors the tooth down into its socket. So here we see the three types of fibrous joints. We have the sutures that are found exclusively between the bones of the skull. Um, again, joints are held together with very short internet connecting fibers with the bone edges interlocking and found only in the skull. Syndesmoses, um, joints are held together by a ligament. Uh, the fibrous tissue can vary in length, but is uh, longer than in sutures. And then gumphoses, the peg in socket fibrous joints. Um, example is the periodontal ligament that holds the tooth in the socket. So here we see the periodontal ligament. Next type of joints are um, classif uh, classification um, by structure are the cartilaginous joints. So bones are united by cartilage. They again lack a joint cavity and there are two types of cartilaginous joints. We have a synchondroses and a symphysis. And again, when you see the word or um, the root chondro, think cartilage. So synchondroses and symphyses. For synchondroses, we have hyaline cartilage that will unite the bones. We can see this in the epiphyseal plates. Um, and then the joint between the first rib and the manubrium is a type of synchondroses united by hyaline cartilage. So here we see the epiphyseal plates. Um, this is the head of the humerus. Um, we can find the epiphyseal plate in our long bones and it's just a temporary hyaline cartilage joint. And then uh, another example of synchondroses is the joint between the first rib uh, and the sternum. And this is immovable, so functionally speaking, uh, these are a type of synarthroses. Symphysis, this is when we have fibrocartilage that unites the bones, and we saw what fibrocartilage looks like um, in the first unit. Uh, fibrocartilage resists tension and compression. They are slightly movable joints that provide strength with flexibility. So these are sort of amphiarthroses if we function if we classify them functionally. Examples of our symphyses include the um, intervertebral discs that are again made up of fibrocartilage as well as the pubic symphysis that unites the two um, ox coxae or the hip bones together anteriorly. Um, hyaline cartilage can be present as articular cartilage. So here we see examples of our symphyses. Uh, these are the bones that are united by fibrocartilage. We see that fibrocartilaginous intervertebral disc. Um, and these are sandwiched actually um, between hyaline cartilage, but here is our intervertebral disc. And then the pubic symphysis, again, uniting the two um, pubic bones of the hip bones together anteriorly. So this is the pubic symphysis. The third type of joint that we can classify uh, structurally are synovial joints. The synovial joints are the most movable type of joints. All synovial joints are diarthroses, meaning they are highly movable. 
However, not all uh, diarthroses are synovial joints, and we saw examples of other uh, joints that fit under diarthroses, however, but are not uh, synovial joints. So synovial joints each contains a fluid-filled joint cavity. And here is the general structure of uh, synovial joints. We have an articular cartilage. Um, so the ends of the opposing bones are covered with hyaline cartilage. We talked about the articular surfaces of some bones. Um, this articular cartilage helps with um, absorbing compressive or compressive forces. We then have a joint or articular cavity, and this structure is unique to synovial joints. The cavity is a potential space that holds a small amount of synovial fluid. We also have an articular capsule. This is a jo the joint cavity is enclosed in a two-layered capsule with a fibrous layer. This fibrous layer is made up of dense irregular connective tissue, which strengthens the joint. Again, uh, going back to our history, we know that dense irregular connective tissue uh, is capable of handling stress in many directions. Also within the articular capsule, there is the synovial membrane. Uh, this is a layer of loose connective tissue. Uh, this synovial membrane lines the joint's capsule and covers the internal joint surfaces and helps function to make the synovial fluid within the articular capsule. Speaking of synovial fluid, synovial fluid is a viscous fluid similar to raw egg whites. It's a filtrate of blood and arises from capillaries in the synovial membrane. It contains glycoprotein molecules that are secreted by fibroblasts. Um, we are able to actually uh, kind of squeeze synovial fluid into and out of the articular cartilage, and this is called a weeping lubrication. So what we do is we put uh, pressure on joints. So putting pressure on joints squeezes synovial fluid into and out of the articular cartilage. Also part of the synovial joints, we have reinforcing ligaments. These ligaments are often the thickened parts of the fibrous layer. Um, sometimes are extracapsular ligaments, extracapsular meaning they are located outside the capsule, and sometimes are intracapsular ligaments, and these are uh, ligaments located internal or inside the capsule. We also know that synovial joints are richly supplied with sensory nerves. These nerves help detect pain. Also, most will monitor how much the capsule is being stretched. They also have a rich blood supply. Uh, the blood supply uh, mostly supplies the synovial membrane. Um, we have extensive capillary beds that produce the basis of synovial fluid. Um, we also have branches of several major nerves and blood vessels. So here is a typical synovial joint. Again, we have um, reinforcing ligaments that can be either internal or external. We have a joint cavity that contains uh, synovial fluid. We have the articular cartilages um, between the two opposing bones. Uh, usually this is made up of hyaline cartilage. Uh, we have the articular capsule with the two layers. We have the fibrous layer and the synovial membrane. Um, and we know that the cells within the synovial membrane produce synovial fluid. Um, and these all kind of um, make up the synovial joint. Some synovial joints contain an articular disc. Uh, these occur uh, especially in the TMJ or temporomandibular joint. Uh, this is found, um, this is the joint between uh, the mandible, what attaches the mandible to the skull. Um, it also occurs at the knee joint. Um, basically, these articular joints occur in joints whose articular, articulating bones have somewhat different shapes. Um, so how do synovial joints function? Basically, um, synovial joints have lubricating devices. We know that friction uh, between two bones could overheat and destroy joint tissue. Synovial joints are subjected to compressive forces as well. And then the fluid is squeezed out as opposing cartilages touch. And so the cartilage can ride on the slippery film, allowing them to kind of slide past one another. 
to allow for movement um, and to kind of decrease the amount of friction between two bones. We want to talk about bursae and tendon sheaths. So bursae and tendon sheaths are not synovial joints, however, rather they are closed bags of lubricant. Um, they help reduce friction between body elements. Bursa are a flattened fibrous sac that are lined by a synovial membrane. The tendon sheath is an elongated bursa that will wrap around a tendon. And we can see examples of this um, in the next slide, especially uh, through the shoulder joint. So these are contained um, within or actually outside uh, the shoulder joint. So here we have the subacromial bursa that is um, been below or beneath the acromion of the scapula. Um, again, just providing some cushion. We can also see um, tendon sheaths that wrap around the tendons uh, are, uh, coming from the muscles that may attach in this area, so we have the tendon of the uh, one of the, the heads of the biceps brachii muscle. So again, the uh, these are basically uh, for reducing friction uh, between body elements. So there are three basic types of movement that are allowed by synovial joints. We have gliding, angular movement, and rotation. Gliding is when one bone um, kind of moves across the surface of another. Angular movements are movements that change the angle between bones. And rotation is basically movement around a bone's long axis. So gliding joints are uh, joints that have flat surfaces of bone, or of two bones that can slip across each other. Gliding occurs between the carpal bones. We just learned about the carpal bones. These are our wrist bones. Um, gliding can also occur between the articular processes of vertebrae and uh, the tarsals. So tarsals are basically uh, the ankle bones within the foot. So here we see uh, the gliding movements at the wrist. Uh, we can um, allow our hand to kind of go uh, medially and laterally. Um, and this is the gliding movement of the carpal bones in the wrist. Angular movements will either increase or decrease the angle between bones. Uh, these movements involve flexion and extension. We also have abduction and adduction, and we have circumduction. So here we can see uh, flexion and extension of the neck. Flexion will decrease an angle between two, um, two structures or two bones, and extension increases the angle between two structures. And here we see flexion um, and extension of the trunk. So we see this person flexing by decreasing the angle uh, between her trunk and her lower limbs. And then extension, she's going backwards and extending her back. So this increases the angle uh, between her trunk and her lower limbs. And then we can see flexion and extension at the shoulder and the knee. Um, again, flexion uh, decreasing the angle um, between the uh, shoulder and the head, and then with flexion of the knee, we can see um, the person decreasing the angle between uh, the lower leg and the thigh, so that's flexion. Extension uh, would involve increasing the angle um, at the leg or at the knee, and then uh, increasing the angle at the shoulder. So abduction, adduction, a way to remember uh, that is imagine um, we, we know we have the midline of the body. Uh, this is the midline of the body, not a very good line. Um, but adduction is basically adding towards the midline. So adding the um, structure toward the midline. So that's adduction. Abduction or 
abduction is bringing uh, the structure away from the midline. So that's abduction. Adduction, adding to or going towards the midline. Abduction, abduction, going away from the midline. So circumduction is moving a limb or a finger so it describes a cone in space. So circumduction of the upper limb at the shoulder is basically just moving your arm in a cone-like or circle. Um, so it actually combines flexion, abduction, extension, and adduction in succession. So that is circumduction, also known as moving in a circle. Rotation involves turning movements of a bone around its long axis. This is the only movement that is allowed between the atlas and axis vertebrae. Atlas is C1 or uh, vertebrae C1 and um, axis is C2. So rotation basically allows you to turn your head at the neck because we know that at the atlas and the axis are bones of the neck or the cervical vertebrae. Rotation also occurs at the hip and shoulder joints. So here we can see rotation of uh, the head uh, between C1 and C2. And we can do lateral rotation of the leg as well as medial rotation of the uh, leg. We have special movements, elevation, um, is lifting a body part superiorly. Depression is moving the elevated part inferiorly. So elevated moving up, depression moving down or inferior. And here we can see um, elevation um, with the elevation of the mandible bringing the mandible up. Depression, we can see depression of the mandible bringing the um, mandible down, allowing for the mouth to open. This is moving uh, the mandible inferiorly. Protraction, uh, this is a non-angular movement anteriorly. Uh, retraction is a non-angular movement posteriorly. So here we can see um, protraction moving the mandible anteriorly going that way, um, going towards the anterior part of the body. So going boop, that way anteriorly. Retraction is moving the body part in the posterior uh, direction, so bring the mandible back towards the head. Then we have supination and pronation. Supination is when we have the forearm rotating laterally and the palm faces anteriorly. Um, I like to say palms facing up. Notice that there is the word up in supination. Um, pronation, the forearm will rotate medially and then the palm will face posteriorly, bringing the radius across the ulna. So here we can see uh, supination versus pronation. So again, supination, rotating the forearm so that the palm faces anteriorly, um, or palms kind of facing up, and then pronation, uh, rotating the forearm so the palm faces posteriorly, or uh, back or towards the posterior. and. Uh, at, with pronation, the radius will rotate over the ulna. Opposition is when the thumb moves across the palm to touch the tips of other fingers, and that's kind of what makes humans very unique because we have opposable thumbs. We're able to use our thumb to kind of touch the other uh, fingers of our hand. And here we see, we see opposition, moving the thumb to touch the tips of the other fingers. Inversion and eversion involve special movements at the foot. With inversion, we can turn the sole medially. Eversion turns the sole laterally. So here we see uh, inversion with the sole turning medially. Eversion is turning the sole of the foot laterally. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, these are up and down movements of the foot. Dorsiflexion involves lifting the foot so its superior surface approaches the shin, whereas plantar flexion depresses the foot, elevating the heel, sort of like pointing your toes. So here we see dorsiflexion where the surface um, goes towards and approaches the shin. Plantar flexion 
uh, depresses the foot but also elevates the heel. So again, we can see um, here someone pointing their toes. This is plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, um, bringing the surface of the foot towards the shin. So now we're going to get into the different joints um, within synovial joints. Synovial joints are classified by shape. Uh, the first synovial joint we'll talk about is a plane joint. The plane joints um, have articular surfaces that are flat planes. Uh, short gliding movements are allowed. Uh, examples of this include the intertarsal and intercarpal joints. Movements are non-axial, meaning gliding does not involve rotation around any axis. So that's why they are non-axial. So here we see a plane joint. Uh, we have non-axial movement, and there are flat articular surfaces uh, between um, the bones. So examples again are intercarpal uh, joints, intertarsal joints, and then joints between vertebral articular surfaces. The next synovial joint is a hinge joint. Uh, with hinge joints, the cylindrical end of one bone fits into a trough on another bone. Uh, angular movement is allowed in one plane, and examples of this include the elbow, ankle, and the joints between the phalanges um, of the fingers. Movement is uniaxial, meaning it allows movement around one axis only. So here's an example of a hinge joint uh, between the humerus and the ulna, um, and we can see that it is uniaxial, um, meaning it only rotates uh, around one axis. This um, we also have the uniaxial movement of flexion and extension uh, with the elbow. We can see that we have a cylinder um, that fits into a trough. And here we have the trochlea of the humerus fitting into the, um, the trochlear fossa of the ulna. Sorry, the trochlear notch, not the trochlear fossa. So the trochlear notch um, articulates with the trochlea of the humerus, um, allowing for that uniaxial movement, and we have uh, flexion and extension at this elbow joint, which is a type of hinge joint. The next synovial joint we'll talk about are pivot joints. So pivot joints are classified as uniaxial, again, one axis. So the rotating bone turns only around its long axis. Examples of pivot joints include the proximal radio ulnar joint, and then the joint between C1 and C2, uh, the cervical vertebrae, atlas, and axis, allowing for uh, that rotation of the head. Um, so here we see a proximal uh, radio ulnar joint um, showing an example of a pivot joint. So we see that there's this ligament that kind of surrounds uh, the head of the radius, which allows for um, that uniaxial rotation um, movement at this joint between the ulna and the radius. So other examples uh, include the atlantoaxial joint, or that joint between C1 and C2. Now another synovial joint is a condylar or ellipsoid joint, uh, allows moving bone to travel. So we have movements such as side to side or abduction, adduction. Again, um, abduction being a movement lateral or away from the midline, whereas adduction is moving towards the uh, midline. And then we have back and forth um, movements uh, or flexion and extension. So again, this is classified as biaxial. So bi meaning two. Movement occurs around two axes. Examples of this include the medico, metacarpophalangeal uh, joints or the knuckles as well as the wrist joints. So condylar joints have sort of oval articular surfaces and again allows for biaxial movement, both flexion and extension, as well as adduction, abduction. Saddle joints, so 
with saddle joints, each articular surface has concave and convex surfaces. Uh, they are classified as biaxial joints, so moving around two axes. Uh, the first metac uh, the first carpo metacarpal joint is a good example, which allows opposition of the thumb. So the um, joint between the carpal bone and the first metacarpal um, is an example of a saddle joint. So here we see the, the um, articular surfaces um, are both concave and convex. So an example of this is that carpo metacarpal joint of the thumb allowing for uh, biaxial movement. We have both adduction, abduction, as well as flexion and extension. Again, this saddle joint allows for opposition um, of the thumb, which allows the thumb to touch the fingertips um, of the other fingers on the hand. Then our next uh, synovial joint is a ball and socket joint. So this is where we have a spherical head of one bone that fits into a round socket of another, and it's classified as multi-axial, which allows movement in all axes, axes. Um, and ball and socket joints, examples of these include the shoulder and hip joints. So we talked about the pectoral girdle, and then we'll talk about um, the the pelvic girdle. So again, uh, the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle um, allow for uh, multi-axial movement. These are considered ball and socket joints. Again, just another type of synovial joint. So here we see the pectoral girdle. Again, we have um, our scapula that articulates with the head of the humerus. This is considered a ball and socket joint. So we have sort of the socket. In this case, it would be the glenoid um, cavity um, and the glenoid fossa that articulates with the head of the humerus um, and allows for multi-axial movement. So movement in all the axes, allowing for uh, flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, as well as rotation. Again, examples of this include the shoulder joint and hip joints. So there are many factors that influence the stability of synovial joints. One factor includes the articular surfaces. The shapes of these articulating surfaces will determine what movements are possible. Um, however, they seldom play a major role in joint stability. However, there are exceptions that do provide stability, such as um, the articular surfaces of the hip joint, the elbow joint, and the ankle. A large factor that influences stability of synovial joints include ligaments. So capsules and ligaments will prevent excessive motions. We have um, ligaments on the medial or inferior side of joints, which prevents excessive abduction, so medial joints um, prevent excessive lateral movement or abduction away from the midline. And then we have our lateral or superiorly located ligaments that resist adduction or movement towards uh, the midline. There are ligaments on the anterior side of a joint that resist extension and lateral rotation. And then ligaments on the posterior side of a joint will resist flexion and medial rotation. Usually the more ligaments there are, the stronger and more stable the joint. Muscle tone is also another factor that influences the stability of a synovial joint. It helps stabilize joints by keeping tension on the tendons. Um, and is important in reinforcing our shoulder and knee joints as well as um, supporting joints in the arches of the foot. So we're going to talk about some select synovial joints. Um, there's the sternoclavicular joint, which is a saddle joint. There are four ligaments that surround the joint, including the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular ligaments, the interclavicular ligament, and the costoclavicular ligament. Helps perform multiple complex movements. And here we see the many ligaments um, that help stabilize the sternoclavicular joint. So the sternoclavicular joint 
is a joint um, between the manubrium of the sternum and the clavicle. And here are some of the movements um, that are um, performed uh, through the uh, sternoclavicular joint. Uh, we have elevation, depression, retraction, protraction, as well as uh, posterior rotation. So again, that uh, saddle joint being multi-axial, meaning allowing movement in multiple axes. The temporomandibular joint, or the TMJ, is a modified hinge joint. Uh, the head of the mandible will articulate with the temporal bone. We have lateral excursion, which is a side-to-side -side movement, and then two surfaces of the articular disc will allow a hinge-like movement, and then gliding of the superior surface anteriorly. So here is that TMJ, or temporomandibular joint, um, and we can see that it is located. Uh, so here we have um, part of the mandible and then kind of articulating with a bone from the temporal bone in the skull. And here it is up close. So here is uh, the condylar process of the mandible articulating with this articular surface uh, within the temporal bone. So this is a sagittal section through the joints. Um, the arrows help indicate the movement in each part of the joint cavity. So this temporomandibular joint allows for lateral excursion, which is the lateral side-to-side -side movements of the mandible. Another joint we want to talk about is the shoulder or glenohumeral joint. Uh, this is the most freely movable joint that lacks uh, stability. The articular capsule is thin and loose, and we actually have muscle tendons that contribute to joint stability. So we have our sits muscles that form the rotator cuff. Um, so a way to remember the sits muscles that contribute to the um, rotator cuff, so we have S, I, T, S. So S, I, T, S, or sits, are the muscles whose tendons contribute to the rotator cuff. So S stands for supraspinatus muscle. Um, then we have infraspinatus muscle. So these two muscles are named based on their location um, uh, along the spine of the scapula. Supraspinatus is the muscle above the spine, whereas infraspinatus is below the spine. Then we have the teres minor muscle. So teres minor muscle um, is another muscle that contributes to the rotator cuff. And then we have subscapularis muscle. Um, so SITS sits. These are the muscles whose tendons contribute to uh, this uh, glenohumeral joint or form, form the rotator cuff. So here we see a frontal section through the right shoulder joint. Um, we can see uh, the fibrous layer of the articular capsule. So again, this is a, a synovial joint. So it has the, the classical features of a synovial joint. We have um, a capsule, we have the uh, synovial membrane uh, that secretes synovial fluid. Uh, we have ligaments that help reinforce the capsule. Um, and uh, so we have the glenoid uh, cavity um, forming one of the articular surfaces, and we have the head of the humerus. And then we have the many ligaments that kind of help reinforce that joint. Here's a gross section um, of the glenohumeral joint. So uh, here we have the articular cartilage of the glenoid fossa, and then the articular cartilage of the head of the humerus. Um, and then we have this uh, cavity here where we'll find synovial fluid. Um, again, this is the glenohumeral joint, a type of synovial joint.
So we talked about the tendons um, and the muscles of the, the tendons of the muscles that uh, contribute to the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is made up of four muscles and their associated tendons. Again, we have um, our sits muscles, supraspinatus located above the spine of the scapula, infraspinatus located below the spine, teres minor, and subscapularis. Um, and we know that rotator cuff injuries are common shoulder injuries. So on this next slide, we can see um, the anterior view and the tendons um, that help contribute and uh, stabilize the glenohumeral joint. Here's just a lateral view um, of the socket or the uh, glenoid cavity uh, that um, helps form the glenohumeral joints. And then we can see how the tendons of those uh, cyst muscles contribute to help stabilize the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. So here's tendon of the subscapularis muscle. Um, we might also have tendons of other muscles because they do um, attach to uh, some of these um, processes or bony markings in that area. So for example, you have the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii muscle. The biceps brachii muscle being um, a muscle of the, the arm, your biceps. And here we can see a posterior view of an opened right shoulder joint. Here is the head of the humerus with its articular surface. Um, and then we can see the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Uh, the acromion up here has been cut, but we can see some of the rotor rotator cuff muscles, again, whose tendons help contribute and stabilize that joint. The elbow joint allows for flexion and extension. Uh, we have articulation of the humerus with the uh, trochlear notch of the ulna that forms the hinge. Um, and then tendons of both the biceps and the triceps brachii provide stability to this joint. So we can actually see here anteriorly would be the biceps, posteriorly would be the triceps. You can see how their tendons contribute to stabilize the elbow joint. So here we have um, the trochlea of the humerus, which is at the distal end of the humerus. Um, again, the elbow joint is a type of synovial joint, so it has that, uh, that capsule and will have that synovial cavity. Um, and then we have the different membranes as well as articular cartilages um, of the two bones that articulate. And then we'll have reinforcing tendons uh, surrounding it. Um, and there might be some cushion like a bursa here. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a type of synovial joint. We can see the olecranon um, here of the ulna and the olecranon uh, and its trochlear notch articulating with the trochlea of the humerus. So this is a lateral view of the right elbow. We can see the different ligaments that help stabilize uh, the elbow joints. Um, there's the radial collateral ligament. Um, and then we have that uh, kind of attaches at the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And we have an annular ligament also helps uh, reinforce the elbow joint. And the next slide showing just a, a gross cadaver view of the different ligaments. This is a medial view, whereas the other one was a lateral. So we have a medial epicondyle here. Medial epicondyle, again, a very important bony structure when we talk about the muscles of the forearm. But we can see that there are ligaments also that attach to the medial epicondyle. Um, we have the uh, ulnar collateral ligament uh, medially, whereas the radial collateral ligament was located laterally. So again, these ligaments just help reinforce and stabilize the elbow joint. And here we just see a diagram of that medial view of the elbow with the um, ligaments, the ulnar collateral ligament here and the annular ligament there, again, stabilizing this joint. Now the wrist joint is stabilized by numerous ligaments. Um, the wrist joint is composed of the radiocarpal and intercarpal joints. So the radiocarpal joint is the joint between the radius and the proximal row of carpals, specifically the scaphoid and the lunate. Uh, 
Um, this joint allows reflection, extension, adduction, abduction, and circumduction. The intercarpal joint is a joint between the proximal and distal rows of the carpals, which allows for that gliding movement um, within the wrist. So again, just a view of the carpal bones, and we know our mnemonic that helps us remember from proximal uh, row and, and uh, distal row. So the proximal row will go from lateral to medial, so long to pinky. Um, and then the distal row will go from medial to lateral. Here comes the thumb. Okay, so we have scaphoid, uh, lunate, trichetrum, um, and pisiform. And then the distal row, distal row includes the hamate, capitate, uh, trapezoid, and trapezium. Here's a coronal or frontal section of the bones, um, the carpal bones, and we can see the uh, articular surfaces uh, between the bones um, and the intercarpal joint, which allows for that gliding movement within the wrist. And here we can see the many ligaments that help contribute and stabilize the, the uh, wrist. I'm not going to ask you about the uh, different ligaments. Just know that there are ligaments that helps stabilize the wrist and know about the movements within the carpal bones. So the next synovial joint we'll talk about is the hip joint. Again, the hip joint, like the shoulder joint, is a ball and socket structure which allows movement in all axes. Um, however, the hip joint is limited by ligaments and the acetabulum. Um, the acetabulum, so the head of the femur will articulate with the acetabulum. This is the articular surface of uh, the hip bone or the oxcoxae. The stability of the hip joint comes chiefly from the acetabulum as well as capsular ligaments. Um, muscle tendons contribute somewhat to the stability of the hip joint. So here we see um, the afrontal section through the right hip joint. So we have the acetabulum here uh, located on the uh, hip bone or the oxcoxae, and then we have um, the head of fem the femur that articulates um, with the acetabulum. So again, this is a type of synovial joint, so we have a capsule. Um, we have ligaments that help reinforce or stabilize this uh, joint. So we have the ligament of the head of the femur called the ligamentum teres, um, and we have an uh, other ligaments, again, that will help stabilize this joint. So here is just a cadaver section of the hip joint. We can see the articular surface of the head of the femur. Um, then we have ligaments of the head of the femur called the ligamentum teres. Um, and then we can see uh, part of the articular capsule. Um, again, the capsule kind of um, indicating that it is a, a synovial joint. So here we see a posterior view of the right hip joint. Um, we can see the greater and lesser trochanter of the femur, uh, which are located posteriorly, uh, um, posterior to the, the femur. And here are the many ligaments that, again, will help stabilize the uh, the hip joints. Again, you're not going to need to know the specific ligaments uh, for the hip joint, but know that they exist and know that they are um, part of a way that this joint will be stabilized. And here we just see an anterior view um, of the right hip joint with the capsule in place. Um, again, these different ligaments that help stabilize the hip joint. So the knee joint, the knee joint is the largest and most complex joint and acts primarily as a hinge joint. However, it does have some capacity for rotation when uh, the leg is flexed. Um, structurally, it's considered compound and bicondyloid. So um, compound and bicondyloid, this means that um, both the femur and the tibia have two condylar surfaces. So two fibrocartilage menisci occur within the joint cavity. Um, we have a femoropatellar joint which shares the joint cavity 
and allows the patella to glide across the distal femur. The patella is um, our kneecap uh, that is anterior to this joint. And we can actually see it here in this diagram. So here is the patella or kneecap, which is anterior to um, the knee joint. This is the right knee joint. So again, because it's a synovial type uh, joint, it will have a capsule, it will have a um, synovial cavity with synovial fluid. We have the articular surfaces of uh, the two bones, in this case of the distal femur um, and the proximal tibia. And then we have ligaments, both um, external and internal, that help reinforce this knee joint. So here we can see a superior view of the right tibia uh, in the knee joint showing the menisci as well as the cruciate ligaments. So we have, um, if this is anterior, this is posterior, um, we have the ACL, which is the anterior cruciate ligament here. And then we have the PCL, which is the posterior cruciate ligament. And we call them cruciate ligaments because if you actually look at them from the anterior, they form an X. Um, so uh, one is more anterior and one is more posterior, but if you look at it um, from the, an anterior, even a posterior view, you can see that they, they form sort of an X. So again, we have um, the articular surfaces or articular cartilage um, on the medial tibial condyle and then one on the lateral tibial condyle. So this make, it makes this joint bicondylar, meaning there are two uh, condyles. So the capsule of the knee joint covers posterior and lateral aspects of the knee. Also covers the tibial and femoral condyles, um, but does not cover the anterior aspect of the knee. Um, the anterior aspect of the knee is actually covered uh, anteriorly by three ligaments. We have the patellar ligament, and then we have the medial and lateral patellar retinaculae. So here we see an anterior view of the right knee. We'll see that patella um, and then we can see the different ligaments that help reinforce this joint. So uh, we have the tendons of the quadriceps femoris, which are your quads in your uh, leg or thigh. And then we have um, patellar ratinaculums here. And then we have our collateral ligaments. So there'll be, um, if this is the tibia, this is the tibial collateral ligament. And if this is the fibula, uh, we'll have a fibular collateral ligament. Okay, so a lot of ligaments do help stabilize uh, the knee joint. So we know that ligaments of the knee joint become taut or tight when the knee is extended. Um, and we have extra capsular and capsular ligaments. So the ligaments of the knee joints again, our extracapsular and capsular, so within the capsule. This includes the fibular and tibial collateral ligament. Um, you might also see the word peroneal. Peroneal is actually old school for, for, um, for fibular, sorry. Um, so instead of fibular, you'll see peroneal. So fibular and tibial collateral ligaments, there's also an oblique popliteal ligament and an arcuate popliteal ligament. These are the extracapsular and capsular ligaments. So here, looking at a posterior view, we can see um, some of the ligaments that help contribute to the, the knee joints. So we have um, laterally, because the fibula is lateral, there's an L in fibula. Laterally, we have the fibular collateral ligament and more medially, because the tibia is medial, there'll be the tibial collateral ligament, okay? And then you'll see um, kind of from behind the knee, if we remove um, the knee, we can see uh, an oblique popliteal ligament. Um, and then we can also see an arcuate popliteal ligament here. Within the capsule, we have intracapsular ligaments. Um, the in, in, intracapsular ligaments include the cruciate ligaments. Um, they look, they're called cruciate ligaments because again, if you look at them, um, either anterior or posterior, they cross each other like an X. 
So each cruciate ligament runs from the proximal tibia to the distal femur. Um, the cruciate ligaments include the ACL, which is the anterior cruciate ligament, and the PCL, which is the posterior cruciate ligament. So here we see um, the cruciate ligaments anteriorly. Again, we have the ACL um, and the PCL. Um, if we look at them from the anterior view, they look like they form an X. Okay. Um, so we have the cruciate ligaments, which are intracapsular, um, and then uh, the articular capsule has been removed, and we can see that the quadriceps tendon is cut and reflected distally. Here is the patellar ligament uh, within it, contains the patella, and then here is the cut quadriceps tendon, which is a tendon um, that is formed from the contributions of the quadriceps muscles within the leg or the thigh. Okay, and then um, again we have our different ligaments that help contribute. We have a tibial collateral ligament which is located me medially because the tibia is more medial. And then we'll have a fibular collateral ligament. Again, it used to be called peroneal, but um, nowadays we call it the fibular collateral ligament. And here's just a gross cadaver uh, view showing the intracapsular ligaments the or the cruciate ligaments. So we have the anterior cruciate ligament, which is located more anteriorly. Um, and then we have the posterior cruciate ligament. So the purpose of our intracapsular ligaments, the uh, cruciate ligaments prevent undesirable movements at the knee. So the anterior cruciate ligament will prevent anterior sliding of the tibia, whereas the posterior cruciate ligament prevents forward sliding of the femur or backward displacement of the tibia. So we talk about the cruciate ligaments and how um, they stabilize the knee joints. So during movement of the knee, the ACL prevents anterior sliding of the tibia, whereas the posterior cruciate uh, prevents posterior sliding of the tibia. When the knee is fully extended, both cruciate, cruciate ligaments are tight or taut, and the knee is locked. So here we see a tightness or tautness to the anterior cruciate ligaments and the posterior cruciate ligaments. So I'm going to end part one of uh, this chapter on joints, and there will be another video for part two of this chapter, for chapter nine.